Hey everybody, thank you so much for tuning into today's Facebook Live. This is the first in a series of conversations we're going to be doing here at Atlantic Health System about coronavirus in our communities. My name is Luke Margolis. I'm the Corporate Communications Director for Atlantic Health, and today I am joined by our President and CEO, Brian Grandiolati. Brian, thanks for doing this today. Thanks, Luke. It's a great opportunity to um, have an important conversation with uh, many members of our community, our team members here at Atlantic, uh, and whoever else is uh, watching in on this. Thank you. Uh, okay, so let me give you a little bit of the run of show, and we'll, Brian and I will jump into our conversation. Um, first of all, uh, you may have seen in the invitation for this event that we were asking folks to submit some questions, and the response really was overwhelming. So thank you to everybody who submitted questions. We'll get to those a little bit later in our program here today. Um, Brian and I will have a chat, but if you want to offer some thoughts and comments in the thread as we move along, please use the hashtag caring together. Uh, it allows us to kind of uh, keep tabs on, on those things so we can respond to you guys either now or in the future. Uh, and perhaps some of those things might make for future topics. Uh, I know we got a number of clinical questions, Brian, uh, about this, and we're definitely going to do another Facebook Live just on the clinical stuff. So that should be pretty exciting for folks as well. The more information we can get out, the better. Exactly right. So let's jump right into it. Um, one of the things, and in fact, this was a lot of the questions we got fell under this topic, so we wanted to start with it. Um, what can folks either at home or in their communities do to continue to improve their odds of staying safe. Things they can do to help themselves and even help us if need be. Um, the top one was one that Governor Murphy's talked a lot about, and I want to get your opinion on this. Social distancing. Just as important now as it was in weeks past, how important is that as a concept still? Social distancing is the single tool that we have under our control to keep this from spreading. I can't emphasize that enough, and the governor is uh, spot on on that. Uh, it is one of those things that each and every one of us in this country can do to help. And it's more about not helping ourselves, it's about helping other people. Okay, because I guess the thought there being we don't, not everybody knows whether or not they have this, right? So you could be asymptomatic, uh, and the only way to ensure is by staying home. Yeah, and that's absolutely true. And we also know that um, people who um, are most vulnerable to this, um, who are at most risk, are the ones who are absolutely taking this thing seriously. What I worry about are people who think they're bulletproof, and they're not taking it seriously. And that's a big problem. So your kids, their friends, make sure that they take this seriously because it's their grandmothers and grandfathers that they're going to hurt. We hear a lot of conversation now, uh, and the president has talked about this recently, and that of course is <clears throat> if you do go out into public wearing masks, right? right? And, and there's, I think, a little bit of confusion that was indicated in some of the questions we received from folks. So what does that mean? Should everybody be wearing N95s out in public? I know that the president's talked about scarves and other things. What, what's your take on that? What, what do you think we should be advising people to do? You know, I get asked that question about masks a lot. You know, in a perfect world, we would have um, people with N95s on. Now, I've got to tell you from having worn them, they're not the most comfortable thing in the world. And our caregivers, uh, um, they protect our caregivers, but they're uncomfortable. Um, but it's not a perfect world. And as everybody's aware, we just don't have enough uh, N95 masks in this country. As a matter of fact, we've, we're seeing uh, shortages even on things like surgical masks. So while I think uh, wearing a mask can be helpful, it's more helpful protecting others than protecting yourself in terms of the nature of the masks that people are wearing. I think um, the most important part is please don't further deplete the supply in the medical systems because that's where we are protecting our team members and without our team members you're going to see this uh, really uh, deteriorate very quickly. The second thing that I worry about uh, as it relates to masks is that they're not a substitute for social distancing and I worry that people are going to assume okay so I've got this mask on now we can have a, a party of 30 people and everything's going to be okay. That is not the case. But people need to do what they feel comfortable with as it relates to a mask. I know that uh, my wife Donna uh, went out to the grocery store yesterday and did wear a mask. Um, so I think it's, a, it's an individual choice. Um, obviously, if you have something available, it's not depleting the system uh, for healthcare providers. 
um, I don't think it's a bad idea at all. I think it's a good idea. Um, and in terms of social distancing, one thing to note, you may wonder, traditionally when Brian and I appear in these kinds of things, we are seated a little more closely than we are. This is a fairly wide shot for this kind of setting. This table is actually six feet across, right? So what that does is it, we now know that we are properly distanced for something like this. So again, um, a good rule of thumb to kind of keep in mind. Um, talking about um, ensuring supply for, um, for healthcare professionals, we have had a tremendous outpouring of support from the communities as it relates to donations. Um, so a shout out to everybody who has sewed masks or donated items to us. Um, <clears throat> Still in need? Should we? Should people still be looking to donate to us? What's what? What dynamic do you do you want to see from folks there? Absolutely, um, there is not enough uh, of a supply of, of PPE in this in this country in this world actually, uh, in order to uh, take care of this pandemic. So anything that people can do to help us while the production levels are getting ramped up is important. I know that just this week we've had two community members who have had contacts, uh, um, you know, the CEO of Untucket, as an example, who uh, helped uh, and, and gave us some masks that he was able to uh, procure through his channels. And we had something else occur today from one of our suppliers, Cardinal, with uh, small N95s that uh, are helpful. Those came in as donations. I know the ShopRite stores have been providing us uh, a lot of that, and it's really important. But let me try to put into context why um, PPE uh, is so important, but some of the other things that we're actually uh, uh, looking at so that people have a, a full sense of this. You know, at the very beginning of uh, this uh, pandemic, we needed to have testing in order to determine where we were. Right. And that was delayed. And at the very beginning of this, um, in February, um, in order to get one of those tests, you had to go through a very difficult process, first through the state and then through the CDC, and the number of tests were just absolutely limited. Um, now, that testing piece has gotten better, but it's not where it needs to be. And in order to control this pandemic, we've got to get that right. And so, what testing does when you're starting to see your levels ramp up is it becomes the device that helps us manage our protective equipment. Because when a patient comes into uh, our care settings, whether it's an emergency department or, or elsewhere, and they have symptoms of this uh, virus, we have to assume that they have the virus. And so if they're hospitalized, we have to put our team members in that same level of protective equipment that we would put uh, if they were caring for somebody that we had a known diagnosis through a lab test on. And, and so if our ratio of uh, testing uh, shows that half of the people we test um, don't actually ultimately end up with that, but we've got to wait four or five days to get that test result, which is not unusual, it's just gotten better than that in the last week, that means that we've taken about half that supply of protective equipment. And so if our audience could, could imagine this, uh, a typical patient in a hospital goes through, our team members really require about 20 sets of protective equipment per day. And that's not just masks. No, that's, that's gloves, right. that's gowns, that's footwear, that's headwear. In many instances, it's shields, depending on what people are doing. It's goggles and glasses. So this testing piece is a predicate to everything we're going to do. And then going forward, as we think about um, what is life going to be like after this surge, um, testing is going to be critical to determine um, what the uh, rate of spread has been in the communities, how many people um, have had the disease, therefore they are in essence immunized from it and we're going to have to use testing to identify hot spots where we need to have interventions because that's the only way we're going to be able to open up our economy uh, is to be able to continue this regime of testing. That, I want to follow up on that there's because some of the questions we got were you know when does this end right like how do we know that you I know that you've used an analogy in the past of, of 
this idea of like a forest fire sort of analogy. Can you talk a little, explain a little bit about that? Because I think some people are wondering, when do we know when we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel here? So, um, you know, if you, if you turn on Channel 12 and, and watch uh, our governor, who's been doing just a, a great job communicating um, with, uh, with the citizens in New Jersey, and he's doing it six and seven days a week with his team, they'll show you graphs that depict varying models. We're also doing our own modeling here uh, at Atlantic, where we're taking some of the models that are being used around the world and then we're taking the clinical data that we have and our data scientists and other folks are doing the analytics are really looking at it day after day. So I was just looking at um, uh, a lot of our modeling data. And one of the things that seems to be converging right now is that we're going to be hitting a peak probably in the next week here in our market. So that's you know right, right below the city into the center of the state of New Jersey. And um, what that means is we're going to hit a point where we're going to stop seeing the escalation of these cases um, as it relates to hospital utilization. And we're going to see a bit of a plateauing. And that's consistent with what we're feeling. So over the last four or five days, we've seen uh, uh, mid-single-digit rates of increase after seeing uh, our rates doubling over the last um, you know, uh, two weeks, uh, almost every three or four days. So that's a good sign. The question is, how long is that plateau going to last? And then how long is the, is the curve down? Because this is not something that's binary. It's not a light switch where we're going to have it on today and off tomorrow. And we're still going to have to uh, work through this. That's, again, why uh, the social distancing is very important. Because even when we hit that apex, we will still have a huge disease burden in our communities and we need to make sure that we ride that down uh, in a way that um, we don't see it bounce back up. So my analogy to a forest fire is this. We are in the forest fire right now, and this is burning very w widely, and we don't have a lot of tools to address, address the fire. Um, but after we reach the this peak of this and we start to see the fires go down a bit, we still will have hot spots that are going to pop up. Geographically. Yeah, geographically. And those hot spots, we're going to have to really have a, a contained focus on that. You know, yesterday, um, Dr. Sherris uh, and I uh, had, uh, and, and uh, our Chief Diversity Officer Ahmed had a, a good conversation with the mayor of Morristown and his team. Uh, about some of the unique challenges that we have in some of the neighborhoods in mm -hmm. Morristown. And what we talked about was how do we really look very closely, almost at a block-by-block -block level, uh, uh, to make sure that if we begin to see um, uh, things happening there, social distancing not happening or whatever, that we really work hard with those communities um, to help them. Because oftentimes, communities who are underserved or have other social determinants of health that make it harder for them to navigate the system, language barriers, et cetera, um, those are going to be special areas where we need to work. So this is going to be, you know, uh, Dr. Fauci was asked a question about what's, what's life like, like after COVID. Right. And he said, honestly, it's going to be different. That's an example of why it's going to be different. Some of the questions that we got, um, we're, we're very general in the sense of, of how are we doing as a system, right? Mm -hmm. How are we holding up to, to the large numbers of, of patients mm -hmm. that you mentioned previously? Um, we talked a little bit about the role that testing plays and, of course, the essential nature of PPE, but there are other pieces of equipment and other things that are really essential to our response as well. Can you address a couple of maybe um, the medications that, that I know are in short supply in some areas, how we're, uh, yeah. ventilators are a common topic of, of conversation. How are we doing as a system in keeping up with, with the rapid growth we've seen over the last few weeks? Yeah. And, and, and we, have seen, we have seen rapid growth. Let me just throw some quick numbers out. Sure. You know, we've tested over 8,000 people. And remember, this started uh, back, uh, I think, uh, around the, the, the 4th of uh, March. It's just over a month. Yeah. And it, uh, it's, it seems like it was a year ago. That's true. Um, and, uh, you know, when we um, look at that, we've, we've had about a 44% positive rate uh, for those tests. So we've had a lot of people that we've had to um, 
really care for. We've had about 1,500 people admitted um, to our hospitals. Uh, and um, we've had to provide triage and guidance through our call centers to about 3,500 people. And this has been a complete uh, opportunity to transition into telehealth, where we've had uh, three or 4,000 telehealth visits uh, uh, in a very short period of time. The other thing we've done is really focused our testing on, on healthcare workers and first responders, and we're really, really proud we've been able to serve uh, over 2,000 of those. And our emergency departments have been flooded with patients, over 4,400 of them. But when we think about patients, about 80% of the patients who are tested positive end up doing okay. About 20% end up in the hospitals, and about a third of the 20% that end up in the hospitals end up uh, in our ICUs and on ventilators. So one of the challenges that we've had is transitions of care. So how are people doing when they end up in the hospitals? And the good news is that, that we've really transitioned 600-plus uh, people uh, into uh, back either into home or into uh, their nursing homes or other settings. And that's a really good news story. And one, people don't. We seem to lose sight of that. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, other, the other thing that we're starting to see now, which has been positive, is we're, we've been able to um, uh, wean patients from uh, the ventilators, the machines that help them breathe or breathe for them over a period of time. Because once a patient gets on a ventilator, oftentimes they are on their 12, 18, 20 days. And so we are starting now to see these patients come off of the ventilators. And in terms of your comment about that's good news that we don't often talk about, that's a real boost to our team members. I know on Saturday evening I got a, uh, an email from um, uh, Stephanie uh, Schwartz at, at Chilton um, uh, just telling me that they had extubated their first patient, gotten the first patient off uh, that, and how thrilled their team was. Trish O'Keefe said the same thing to me. Uh, they are, they've extubated a, a number of patients, and every one, the group cheers about it. And those wins are really important. Uh, and to your point, uh, we're not talking enough about that, particularly in, as you turn the TV on. Yeah. Um, but make no mistake, this is a very difficult virus. I want to pivot to a little bit of that. It's a, a good segue, a good opportunity to segue into it. And that is what our team members are coping with and dealing with throughout this process, I think. Yeah. There is no doubt that our team members train and practice for this, yeah. um, and the effort that's put into that is tremendous. But when things like this arise, they come with sets of challenges and difficulties that maybe people don't realize until yeah. they deal with them. And I want to talk specifically about two things you talked about. Isolation and compartmentalization. Can, right. um, they may not be familiar terms for some of our audience, so can, can we walk through sure. that a little bit? And, um, you know, this... Um, this conversation really was generated from a conversation that I had with Trish O'Keefe, mm -hmm. who is our president uh, at Morristown and our uh, chief nursing officer for our system and uh, started at Morristown when she was a candy striper. Mm -hmm. and we're very, very proud of her. Um, you know, uh, I was asking her one day, <clears throat> how's the team doing? And what's different about this, this challenge? Because, you know, in healthcare, this is what we're trained to do. I started working on an ambulance as an EMT and you know this is what we do we, we prepare for these kinds of things but this one's a little different you know I, I look back uh, uh, at the bus uh, accident that uh, we had and you know we just did an amazing job taking care of those kids and the adults and um, but it had that that uh, disaster that we were in had a beginning right we mm -hmm. knew when the bus accident yeah. occurred we knew when we got all the patients um, into the right levels of care, and then obviously um, uh, those patients required, some of those patients required and continue to require care ongoing. But you're able to um, say as a healthcare provider, we did everything we could, we got that patient where they needed to be, um, and you can compartmentalize it. Then you can go home to your family and you hug your child because you can imagine that, that your child could have been in that bus, but you're able to somewhat compartmentalize it. This virus you can't compartmentalize because it's around you in the community. You're worried about your family getting this virus. 
you're worried about getting it yourself. Uh, even if you have all the protection you need and you're using it properly, which we believe we're doing here, um, you still might pick it up in the community. So you can't get away from it. And I don't know about you, but every time you turn on the news, that's front and center in your, in your face, which is why I've been turning to uh, uh, the Food Channel uh, <laughs> to, uh, evac to uh, kind of get out of, get out of uh, line of sight of this for a couple minutes. Yeah. The second is this notion of isolation. By its nature, social distancing, which I think is physical distancing, because we've been doing a lot on, on uh, FaceTime and yeah. Zoom and other things with our family members and friends. Um, but this notion of isolation is one that healthcare people are not used to. I mean, healthcare, we're trained as a team. We may be trained in our individual disciplines, but we're trained as a team. And one of the things that, that Trish pointed out to me is if you think about this right now, um, particularly in an ICU setting, um, our team members have the responsibility of caring for a very sick patient on a ventilator. They are kept apart from the family because we don't want the families to uh, develop this virus right. and we also don't want to bring it into our facilities any more than it is. And uh, at the same time, um, you know, our, our team members don't have that same intimacy that they have with their teammates. Right. Meaning, you know, I remember as an EMT, if you had, I remember a particularly bad case, you debriefed afterwards, you all sat down together. There might have been some tears and there were some hugs. You can't do that now. And so that sense of isolation is there. And I know I feel it. You know, I feel that in the role that I am in. Uh, I want to be in the hospitals. I want to be there. You round. You and I, yeah, and I, it, but I can't uh, in the way that I, I want to because, you know, I'm in that target zone, yeah. right? I'm in that target zone of uh, needing to, to do that. So you have to find other ways of um, interacting and you have to find other ways of trying to deal with that isolation. But make no mistake, um, this is very different and Trish, I thought, really clearly identified that. Yeah, and in a way that I'm sure that our audience can understand as well. Um, all right, so like I said, um, we got a ton of questions from folks out there and so thank you very much because at the end of the day, this is about helping all of you uh, understand a little more about what we're, we're, we're doing here. So thank you for that. Um, we're gonna try to get to a couple of the ones that we have now. Again, they all sort of fell into similar kind of buckets. So we'll choose a couple of the ones that are indicative of that. And, and uh, remember, we're gonna be doing more of these to come. So a lot of the clinical ones, we're gonna get to in future um, Facebook Lives. So um, let's start with one. Um, uh, from Dan. Uh, Dan actually asked a three-part question, so out of fairness, we'll take one of them. Um, he talked about uh, something that we're seeing across the river in New York, an idea of one health system for the state. Um, are, is there a consideration of doing something like that here in New Jersey, and how useful would right. that be, or might it be, in, or how has it been here in New Jersey to do something? Right, so um, that notion of how do we work together mm -hmm. um, is, is critically important. And uh, what we did early on uh, here at Atlantic is I reached out to uh, my colleagues uh, at Hackensack, Meridian, and Barnabas, the two CEOs, and we had a conversation about, you know, we're going to be better together on this. Right. And these are, you know, three organizations that compete pretty hard against each other uh, in, our, in our market. And so about three weeks, four weeks ago, we began this work together. We get together twice a week, our teams get together virtually, uh, and then there's a lot of work that goes on in between. And that's really helped us get needed supplies and medications and other things, and it's also helped us um, really share learnings and best practice. The state has also engaged in that um, uh, and broken the state into three different regions, again, to try to bring things together in a, in a way to be helpful. Um, I think that the governor, again, and the, and the commissioner of health have been doing a very good job about this notion of one New Jersey, and I think that we are learning how to do that each and every day in a better and better way. Excellent. Um, thank you, Dan, for the question. Um, here's a, another one that I think is, is interesting. Harold asked this, and, um, and maybe we can talk about, you know, uh, each of our facilities, I think, sort of address this issue. 
He wants to know, um, are EDs open to non-COVID-19 uh, patients as well? And I know that, you know, yeah. whether it's Overlook in the Western region as well, what, what, are, are yeah, they open our, for those? Our, our EDs are absolutely open. Um, if I just look at our admissions, you know, uh, over 25% of our admissions, our hospital census, are patients who don't have COVID or are not, or are not being tested for it. So uh, they're absolutely open. And when you go to the ED, you're going to see some tents and some structures set up. Those are intended to screen COVID patients so that we are not putting other patients in harm's way. Excellent. Um, again, I, I, we have some questions that are sort of similar. So the folks who are asking these are representing everyone who asked these questions. Um, Janet had a question about well patient visits. Uh, and it's a little long, so, but basically to summarize, um, elective and non-emergent procedures were uh, postponed, mm -hmm. right, for us. So what do, what do you recommend for those patients who are saying to themselves, you know, I was really supposed to see my doctor about something that's pretty important yeah. to me. What do I do? So connect with your physician's practice. I know in the Atlantic Medical Group and many of our, our uh, associated, uh, affiliated private practices um, have, have uh, telehealth capabilities. And we've been helping roll that out. And as I said, we've had thousands and thousands of telehealth visits. I got one from my dermatologist the other day, a request saying, hey, why don't we do your uh, screening uh, via telehealth? So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing, though, is, is never hesitate to call your doctor um, because she or he will make sure that they get you to that right level of care and give you advice, even if it is simply a well check. Thank you. And thank you to Janet for asking that question. Um, John wanted to know, and, and this harkens back to something that you talked about a little earlier, um, flattening the curve. Mm -hmm. How do we know when we have flattened that curve? What will be, and I, I think you touched a little bit about the number of cases mm -hmm. and the growth, but what, when will you feel comfortable knowing that that is starting to happen? So we're, we're, starting, to, uh, we're starting to see this. Um, what, what we've... Um, measure every day are how many patients are admitted to our hospitals. And over the last week, we've started to see low uh, single digit numbers. And that's telling us when we compare it to our modeling that we're starting to hit that point. We know we're going to be there when we see that number stabilized over a period of time and we start to see it turn down. And that's uh, really um, what we're looking for. Now, there's going to be a lag on hospital resources after that because of the long lengths of stay of these patients. You know, a typical uh, inpatient that's not in critical care or not on a vent stays perhaps six or eight days. Patients on vents can be here 18, 20 days, and that's going to create a queuing. Um, so we're still going to have a lot of resources, but we know that, that we're starting to see the number of increase go down and that's going to allow us to uh, make sure we have the right kind of resources going forward. We are nearing our, our time, yeah, but couple, I want to give you an opportunity yeah, to touch on a couple last yeah, thoughts. Yeah, a couple you things. You know, I'm, uh, I received a letter, uh, uh, an email yesterday from um, one of our members of our medical group, and uh, he, uh, he lives in New Rochelle, uh, and he's very involved uh, in a synagogue in, in New Rochelle, which was you know, kind Very of the happy center yeah. uh, at the beginning of the New York uh, migration. And uh, he uh, talked a bit about um, uh, our response here from his perspective. And, uh, you know, it, it couldn't have been a nicer letter at a nicer period of time, but he talked about the level of focus that our team members have. He talked about how we are using data and we're approaching this in a in a very logical way, how we're focused on uh, making sure that our team members have uh, what they need. Uh, and uh, particularly, um, you know, uh, he, he compared it to what he was seeing. Mm -hmm. The second thing um, I want to comment on is uh, everybody in, this, in our organization is doing an incredible job. And our frontline workers are people who have their facing patients and people who are helping those, those team members face patients are incredible. But oftentimes the leaders get missed in this equation mm -hmm. and our hospital presidents, and I've mentioned uh, a couple of them, but you know, uh, Bob and, and then Alan, uh, in addition to Trish and, and, and Stephanie, 
they're unbelievable. And um, the teams that they have are incredible. And um, you know, we couldn't do it without them. So it's just been a, it's just been a, a very long run here. Uh, it's only every, been three and a, four and a half weeks. Every <laughs> uh, seven thirty in the morning, we have a. Uh, I think today was our twenty fifth, uh, twenty fifth or twenty seventh right. right. uh, yeah. consecutive uh, day of, of having uh, having our command center. But I just want to say thank you to the leadership team, in addition to the fr frontline caregivers and everybody that supports them. Um, we're, we're very proud of what everybody's doing. And thank you, Brian, thank you. for your leadership, too, for, for all that you've done. Um, all right, folks, uh, that was just about the window that we uh, figured we would do for this. But I know, like I said, there's a lot that everybody wants to, to learn about and hear about. And so, Brian, we're going to do more of these. I hope you'll consider coming back and doing another one soon. Absolutely. Our next one, though, is going to be uh, a week from today, same time. We'll put some information out in more detail about that, but it's going to be very clinical in nature so for those who had interest in that space because you had a lot of questions we did we got um i, I mean i sort of lost track it was we were moving into the hundreds sort of area space there and at that point i need a huge ream of paper to have all of them so uh, again thank you but please keep sending them in because we're going to get them answered um in, in the shows to come also too really important please stay on top of the information we're putting out in the community go to our website on the homepage, AtlanticHealth.org, you will find a section called Community Conversations, and there there will be a link where people can click on and give us their email address so we can make sure we keep you in the loop on everything we're doing and putting out all that important information from all of our experts. Um, again, Brian, thank you. Thank you, Luke. It's my pleasure. All right, folks, thanks for watching. Uh, this will be available in both our Facebook page and for our team members on some of our internal platforms as well. Thanks for watching.